Welcome to the third episode of the Bamboo Chalupa podcast. My name is Brett Snyder, the owner of Agora Inbound. And as always, I am joined by Nate Shiver, the author of ShiverWeb.com. Hello, hello. All right. So today we are going to talk about SEO. You know, big surprise, right? We talk about SEO in every episode. But what we're going to talk about today is this idea of, of search engine optimization typically being used as a synonym for Google optimization. You know, people consider search engines in Google to almost be synonymous these days. But really, it's more than that. You know, in fact, you could argue that with all the specialization that's going on on the web in this day and age, specifically when it comes to finding product and services, that Google is no longer the place you go to find what you want. Google has actually evolved to the place that you go to find the place to go to find what you want. So we're talking about you know, niche search engines and everything like that. So we're going to talk about how to use non-Google search engines to be able to help reach your audience in a much more definitive way. Yeah, because I mean, the, one of the key concepts of marketing is to be wherever your audience is. And they're increasingly own non-Google properties. You know, I know that whenever I think to buy something, I don't go to Google. I go directly to Amazon and I search. A lot of times when I'm looking for a restaurant, I go directly to Yelp and search. And so we're going to briefly touch on a few examples of how SEO can happen on non-Google websites and why doing non-Google SEO is increasingly important for really anyone doing marketing online and how to reverse engineer. We're going to cover examples, but how to think about search engines and how to rank and be wherever your audience is at. And, and remember that the goal of digital marketing in general is not to attract more, you know, not to get Google rankings, it's not to attract Google traffic. It's not even to attract just search engine traffic. The goal of digital marketing should be to grow your business. It should be to generate more revenue, generate more leads, depending on the structure of your business. You know, as Nate said, the idea is to connect with your consumers, whomever they may be, but to connect with your consumers. And Google is now an opportunity with the way that they will list these alternative search engines. It's an opportunity, yes, but it should not be the sole focus of your strategy. So we want to talk about how to use these alternative engines to broaden that strategy, not ignoring Google. You know, by, by no means should you infer that we are saying to ignore Google, but we're saying to open your eyes a little bit more and don't get so focused on just the Google monster because it is a market share leader. It has, I think at this point, 65 to 70 percent of the, you know, the search market share. But we want to talk about that other 30 percent places to go to find very specific and targeted communities that are going to be the consumers that you want. Yeah, and there's a term that is floating around a lot of in, in a lot of places in local SEO uh, named barnacle SEO. And, and this comes from the idea that barnacles a lot of times, you know, that they're immovable, but they can travel long distances by attaching themselves to a large ship. And, you know, just like Google uh, Brett said where we're not saying that you're going to be ignoring Google SEO, but a lot of times optimizing for the second tier or even these simply different search engines will have the effect of helping your Google rankings because a lot of times, you know, if, if you're in a really competitive product space, like say blenders, Amazon will rank for blenders. Wikipedia will rank for blenders. You know, there's all these different e-commerce sites that, you know, you would never be able to outrank for with your you know, myfavoriteblender.com. But a lot of times, if you optimize for Amazon, optim optimize for Wikipedia, you can rank for those big, huge Google searches. And so Barnacle SEO is going to be a concept that's going to come into a lot of these examples. And so even, you know, we're going to start with Amazon. So just because you're optimizing for Amazon doesn't mean we're going to not loop back and end up helping your Google SEO efforts. So Brett, go ahead and start with Amazon and just kind of give the general principle overview, and then I'll kind of dive into the tactics and we'll alternate back and forth and run through these uh, different search engines. Sure. And Amazon is almost at this point, it is the e-commerce search engine. You know, it has gotten to the point where people start to think, if I need to buy X, I'm going to go to Amazon and search for that product, especially when they have the loyalty programs that Google can't offer. You know, there is no Google Prime. You know, there is nothing that's going to say because I found your product on Google that I am automatically, you know, given free shipping. Amazon.com is in a unique position where it still is an independent entity. It is, a, it is able to build these rewards and these promotional programs, 
But at the same time, it is becoming one of the largest search engines for e-commerce product. And so when we talk about the tactics here, you know, we can talk about, you know, the, the number one ranking product in Amazon. It can build a huge, we kind of call it, when Nate and I have been going through kind of terms here, we talk about this huge moat. Because if Google cares about one thing, it's about relevance. And Amazon is able to build this mode around these very targeted and very specific products that are hyper relevant to a particular query. So if you have that Amazon listing and Amazon's top primary goal as a company is sales. So if you have that Amazon listing and you're able to generate sales from that listing, you have that benefit. By generating more sales and engaging and getting reviews on your product, you're able to show higher on Amazon. When they talked about that idea of Barnacle SEO, it's almost an indirect listing in Google because if the number one listing is the Amazon Blenders page and you're the number one product on Blenders, nobody is buying anything by clicking on the Amazon page in Google. That You're not losing anything by having that second tier approach. The idea here is that by having that number one listing in the number one listing, again, going back to that concept of Google being the place to find the place to find what you want, you actually have the opportunity to almost indirectly secure a number one listing on two search engines by going in there and making sure that your product is optimized based on the Amazon algorithm and then again translates into additional visibility elsewhere. Yeah, and there's a, a there was a really well done Moz uh, post by Nathan Grimm, I believe, and we'll link to it in the show notes, diving into exactly what you should optimize for, for Amazon. But if you break it out into just how a search engine would work. It's kind of easy to optimize for Amazon if you think about their end goal, which is sales. So this means doing everything that you can do to push your sales higher. You know, that might mean a more better detailed description, better copywriting. You could look at that and say, oh, they need more on page content, but really they need a better user experience. It means giving better photos. You know, I love being able to click through and zoom in on better photos more copy, more structured data. When you're listing your product on Amazon, they they give you an incredible amount of opportunity to detail your product specifications. And even if those specifications aren't paid attention to by your customers, even though a lot of times they are, um, anything you can do to give Amazon a better sense of what your product is, they might be able to rank it higher. And building links, building endorsements to your Amazon page. You know, in Google, we talk about building links to your website, but it's really getting other people to confirm that you are relevant. And so in Amazon, this might mean getting affiliate links to your Amazon page. Um, and, that, you know, there's even some e-commerce companies who they'll t actually take their highest ROI PPC keyword and send it directly to their Amazon page, where even though you know they're getting a short-term loss of profit because of the 15% cut they're giving to Amazon, it's more that more often made up by getting your product to be the number one best seller, seller in that category, simply by helping push your Amazon sales up, which pushes up your uh, relevance in the, in the Amazon algorithm. Sure. And going back to this idea of links and you know really looking at, you know Nate talked about building links to your Amazon page. Remember that search engines evaluate links not only to the individual page that they actually point to, they also evaluate links based on the overall domain authority and the links pointing to that actual domain. If you have any illusions that your site is ever going to compete with the, you know, the link authority of Amazon.com, you're crazy. And so that's why we talk about this idea of Barnacle SEO, because you can leverage the millions of links to thousands of different categories and products that show that Amazon is this trustworthy domain. Having a placement or having visibility in this highly, highly valued domain actually makes your page more valuable when it comes to those other search engines like Google and Yahoo and Bing, kind of our traditional ones. And so when we talk about this idea of using Amazon, especially for e-commerce products, it really gets back to this idea of being where your audience is, understanding that digital marketing in general, not even just SEO, not even just Google, it encompasses all of them, but digital marketing in general in 2014 is all about providing the optimal user experience. You know, before it started where the optimal user experience was a, re you know, a bunch of relevant copy on the site. And then it evolved to the optimal user experience is one where now we have links that are pointing to it that endorse or validate our content. Now user experience is being tied specifically to things like sales. 
you know, Amazon ties their user experience based on sales because that is authentic user engagement data. You know, they know how many products were purchased. They know how, you know, reviews, again, being something that, that's hugely valuable. So the idea is that if you have an e-commerce site, you want to diversify your approach so that you are going and optimizing for these Amazon listings as well, because you can get the benefit from the Amazon listings as well. You can get the benefits from the Amazon listings, but you can also go in there and get this secondary benefit by means of barnacle opportunities to be able to rank in Google and Yahoo and Bing and some of these other primary categories. The affiliate opportunities that come through Amazon can be really incredible if you're in the right industry. So there's a lot of opportunity to expand your digital marketing campaign, which includes your SEO campaign, but your overall digital marketing campaign to encompass all of the resources that your consumers will use when looking for your products. All right. Well, it's pretty obvious about you know how Amazon would directly tie in for e-commerce companies, but I think that this barnacle SEO it, it even extends out to you know artists and bands. Um, like Spotify. And we'll take just a just a second to talk about Spotify because I'm sure there's not a ton of you know a ton of you know professional musicians that maybe are looking into this. If if there are, we'd love to hear from you. Definitely uh, shoot us an email and let us know what brought you to the, the Bamboo Chalupa podcast. But talking we want to talk about Spotify because at its core, it's a social network. And Spotify is a social network for music. You can share music easily. People can, you can build playlists that can share it. I know that I'm a huge, huge fan of Spotify. I think I've got 100, 150 playlists on mine. You know, and it's it's a way to be able to bring people together and to build, bring a community together. And you go back 10, 15 years ago, I'm not even sure how, how old it actually is, but you go back to when MySpace was the first place that allowed artists to build reputations and grow their community by sharing their music inside this one, you know, this social network. And you can talk about Spotify, you know, they pay royalties, they distribute 70% of their revenues back to the rights holders. So you can look at that and say, well, what's really the point if I'm an artist, you know, to be able to be on Spotify if I'm only getting a piece of, of what I would otherwise get? And the idea is to remember the idea of community. It's a social network and a discovery network. It's a way to be able to say if you're involved in these, you know, in you're finding influencers that can create these playlists that help drive people to new music. The idea is understanding the community aspect behind these niche social, there's these niche search, oh, excuse me, these niche search engines. Understanding that community aspect behind it allows you to be able to identify those key influencers and help you expand the reach of your audience beyond what you would have simply by trying to pull people into your website. You're actually going out to where the communities are and building your presence there. Yeah, and, and I think Spotify, even though it's going used by a very small audience, it has good lessons about the importance of reaching out to community you know, getting included in playlists, getting mentioned by people who have large followings and doing basic things. You know, the other day I was looking for, for a song at, by, by a band and I absolutely could not find it. And it turns out once I did find it, it turns out it's that they simply didn't have their band name. You know, they were, they're one of those bands where they had the lead singer and then a band. And so they were separate, but not really. Anyway, I was thinking it, it's, it's making sure that your presence is correct wherever people are looking for you. And, and just moving down to another example, and that includes places like app stores. You know, the, the tactics here are really not, not that different than the ones we've talked about. With app stores are a search engine for apps. You know, you may be able to say, hey, I've got an app website that I want to rank if somebody's looking for, uh, you know, Android Security, for example, you know, a really great company that that I had the pleasure of working with called Lookout. You know, we did some SEO for for that particular company, and the idea being is we were able to push things to the website. But ultimately, what we learned is that a lot of the people are going to go directly to these app stores. And so, if you can create these off-page signals to be able to say, "Let's get our app store listing ranked as well." So if somebody looks for a you know a security related you know related format, Google already knows that an app store will have that kind of information if you're looking for a mobile application. And so even if you can get your website to rank, what people may be looking for are these actual you know these these app stores individually. And so same kind of principles here. Look at the idea of reviews. Try to engage with anybody in the community. Be able to list any updates that you make and what you would have changed. 
you know, structured data is huge in these alternative search engines, especially when it comes to app stores. You know, maximum information across the maximum number of places is really going to be the key to SEO in 2014 and SEO beyond just Google. Yeah, and and, 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 and with apps specifically, I think this really comes into Barnacle SEO because if, if you are doing SEO on your desktop, all the time, you may never see apps. But just the other day, I, I was you know using Google Now on my Android phone, and a set of search results that are on desktop would have been, you know, just standard websites. I had apps showing up in search results on my phone that would never rank on a desktop search. And so that's the kind of thing where if you're optimizing your app store listing, it may show up in places very very relevant places. And it also reminded me of, you know, the, the power of design and click-through rate and user experience that, that Brett mentioned. You know, we, we, in the desktop SEO world, we, we very rarely think of graphic design as SEO. But I think app stores are really good at showing that if something benefits the end user, if it benefits your end customer, that is a form of search engine optimization because search engines care about those user engagement metrics. And, you know, if, you're, if you can be the one with more engaging copy with a better cover art image that will get that click through rate that you know the extra download that's going to help you rank better and and have all these cascading effects throughout your uh, your marketing and we often don't think about the fact that you know we always think google is infallible anything that anything that these other ones can do and you know, these other alternative search engines can do google is already doing and that's not entirely true you know talking about this idea of design you know google is really in my opinion at least is really lacking in their ability to evaluate or assess quality based on design. To be able to say that a site, the way that a site presents the information, it's not just about the raw information, it's about how it's presented, is something that affects user experience and is something that affects whether or not this is a valuable resource to share. And so there's a lot that we can learn from these app stores to kind of take app stores and these other search engines to take advantage of the fact that Google will likely look to these factors in the future. You know, the web is moving in a direction where it's, you know, a post PC era where people are, you know, are mobile. People are doing a lot on tablets. A lot of people don't own laptops anymore or computers. They do everything from a tablet. You know, understanding, you know, future looking strategies here that will apply to these very, you know, specific networks, these app stores, the Spotify, the Amazons, and some of the other examples we'll go through, but being able to extrapolate those back to things that whether or not that is an active and explicit ranking factor for Google, it will improve the user engagement on your site, assuming you are able to present things that have a stronger engagement and stronger user experience based on design and things of that nature. Well, speaking of, of things that Google does not do well, uh, that seems to be a good segue into Yelp and local SEO. Which I know today I was doing a research for a few local SEO terms, and it seemed like Google was basically outsourcing their local SEO to Yelp, where Yelp was showing up for five of the ten search results for a lot of yeah, these local it's, terms. It's one, yeah, it's because you know honestly, and you can think about it logically. Yelp has a massive head start. You know, it's, it's a social network. You know, digital marketing is all becoming, we talked about it with, with Spotify. We'll talk about it again with Yelp. We'll talk about it in a minute when we get into YouTube, where you know, we, talk, we haven't even talked about it. We could talk about why Google launched Google Plus in the first place and why they tried to make that their local platform. You know, having social engagement is one of those things where it is one of the more difficult aspects to manipulate. In this day and age, you can manipulate link signals. You can almost, you know, in your sleep, manipulate content signals. But being able to manipulate an authentic social following or social engagement is something that is a lot more difficult. And that's where you can learn from Yelp, where you can learn from why is Google, quote unquote, to borrow Nate's phrase, outsourcing their SEO to Yelp? Because Yelp has a community that, regardless of Google's billions and billions of dollars, they cannot buy that type of community. I guess they could buy Yelp, but <laughs> you can't buy that type of community. And that's where, when we talk about Yelp, that's where the tactics here really come into play. Because we want to have this idea of making sure that if you are a small business owner or you have a local presence, that you have to make sure that this is where people are finding information. They want to hear from others that have actually visited this location. The web is anonymous these days. 
Yelp requires you to have an account that you can't post anonymously. You know, you actually have to go in there and be able to say, this is who I am and this is the endorsement that I'm going to make. You know, you're having that same maximum information, but it's coming from a personal, what is, you know, in a lot of ways viewed as an objective source. And it gives the business the opportunity to respond and be involved in that dialogue. This is what Google wanted the first of 12 times they changed their local platform. They wanted that social engagement. And since they weren't able to produce that, they are starting to outsource to, you know, to places like Yelp that will actually go in there that have this, you know, this unmanipulable, you know, network here that we're able to be able to say, this is something that I can use to assess quality. And Google is going to use that based on what they know about the Yelp community. Yeah. And Yelp, I think is a really good example of people focusing so much on Google. You know, you see small business owners trying to get people to review them on Google, on Google Local, Google Plus, whatever Google's current iteration is, Google My Business, I think it is now. Um, yeah, it's Google, Google My Business. And it's Go, Google My Business. And, and you know, there's this myopic focus on Google because that is where the volume is. But we talk about this in our new SEO skill set episode where diversity is just as much of a benefit as having that temporary, you know, temporary or even, even permanent Google ranking where if you're sending some of your community, sending some of your customers, some of your vendors over to Yelp and building up your Yelp community, in the long term, that's going to come come back and help you because you know, if Google changes their algorithm and they decide that all 10 search results should be Yelp listings, you'll be there. You know, or if they all of a sudden decide to kill off Google Plus local, you'll still be there. And so, so I think looking at looking at all the different platforms in your audience and what they're using, and making sure that you're spending the appropriate amount of time on all these different platforms is is really really important. So I agree. YouTube. This will be YouTube. This- we we alluded to YouTube, <laughs> and you know, you knew if we're going to talk about, and this is almost not fair to talk about YouTube as an SEO that's not just Google. They are Google. Because they are Google. YouTube owns YouTube is owned by Google. YouTube has been owned by Google for a long time. I'm not sure if, now I don't know if you know the exact year, but it's 2005. been 2005. 2005. And so YouTube has been owned by Google for the better part of a decade. And a lot of people don't realize that. And the other thing that a lot of people don't realize, one of I know one of my favorite kind of trivia questions when I'm out at the bar with some friends is YouTube is the second biggest search engine. YouTube has more search volume than Bing. It has more search volume than Yahoo. You know, people go to YouTube to find information. They're just looking for a different type of information. There are a lot of how-to content that is, you know, very heavily influenced by, you know, image content and video content. Things I know that when I got married, I had never tied a bow tie before. I didn't go to Google to try to find some article that gives me a six-step explanation on how to tie a bow tie. I went to YouTube because I wanted to see somebody do it. I needed to be able to learn visually. And this visual aspect is really where YouTube was able to take off. And, you know, we will eventually do an entire episode on YouTube because there is so much that we can do with it. But looking at, you know, kind of the the theme that we're going with here, some of the key things to, to keep in mind. YouTube, again, like I said, owned by Google. YouTube will show up in the universal search results. Everybody has seen it, I'm sure. It will show up in your Google search results. It will show up in Bing and Yahoo search results. So again, even beyond just being able to rank in YouTube, there's this opportunity to get increased visibility by ranking in multiple platforms. And YouTube, it is, it's a place where doing true search engine optimization can, can provide a really strong return on, return on investment, return on your time. Because if you've ever trying to do an auto-generated YouTube transcript, which is basically Google trying to listen to your video and creating their own transcript. It's kind of a buried feature, but if you ever try to pull that, you'll know that Go- that YouTube needs a lot of help parsing relevance. And that's because as good as algorithms are, they still can't look at videos the way a human can. And so, you know, if you're going to invest a lot of time creating, editing, and and posting that video content. Think about the extra things that you can do that will align with YouTube's goals, which are you know to be relevant, to get engaged, and to help people discover more videos. You know, can you add 
more annotations? Can you put a little more research into writing your YouTube title tags? Can you fill out the entire description? Uh, and, and can you actually go and promote? Because YouTube is going to look at those engagement factors. And just like Brett has alluded to with Spotify and with Yelp, YouTube is also a social network where they look at likes, they look at subscribers, they look at how many, how long people look at your video before they drop off. You know, and and, it's, and they and they look at they look at views. You yeah, know, they look they at look the at number views. of views that that were you know are actually completed. Yeah, and, and so you you think about you know if you're going to create the video that's going to rank for how to tie a bow tie, which I guarantee you is a very very lucrative term, um, at least for from a volume perspective. If you're going to spend the first five minutes of that before you get to the actual lesson of how to tie a bow tie, doing a long intro, that's going to be bad for user experience. It's going to cause people to pause your video and click and leave. And that video is never going to rank. And it, being able to think, and it's not going to matter you know, how many keywords you stuff in, into your title tag or probably even how many embeds you have. Because looking at your content and you know your YouTube strategy from a holistic perspective, how it helps the user is, is going to help you get ranked in Bing. And as Brett touched on with the universal results, it's going to help you get ranked in YouTube. It's going to help you get ranked in Google and across all Google properties. And one of the things that a lot of people still don't realize is available, and this is something that came out, I think, at least three years ago now. YouTube analytics is actually really, really powerful to be able to see where are you getting views, when was your first view, when was your first embed, where are you actually getting people who might have embedded it elsewhere that are going to come into the site. Definitely go in if you have a YouTube or you're using YouTube as part of your strategy. Definitely make sure you're going in and you're looking at the analytics. And a pro tip that I've used before, a lot of people don't realize that by default, your YouTube analytics are publicly visible. So if you have competitors, <laughs> what was that? I shouldn't admit this on the show, but I didn't know that. Yeah, so your your YouTube your YouTube analytics are by default are publicly visible because so I, you can go and. Well, I was going to say that just from a link building perspective, side tip: looking at your you where videos are embedded on is an incredibly powerful link building opportunity for your website. But I. That's a really cool feature. Really good tip. Yeah. It's great for competitive research as well. You want to see where your competitor videos are actually showing up. Go and take a look at when they got their first one. When did they spike? If there are specific days of the week, then maybe people look for it more. I guarantee you the Geico hump day commercial is not viewed. The the best viewed day is not going to be Monday. You know, you are going there. That's obviously a very you know stark example, but you can see kind of these things to understand when should I maybe do some YouTube advertising? Should I push more advertising on Wednesdays to get the engagement metrics that Nate talked about before? So think about how people are engaging with your content. Think about things like the thumbnail that you use to show your video. You know, that's one of those things where people see it as a suggested one in the sidebar. You know, they're going to see they see a thumbnail. I mean, I do, half the time I don't even read the articles. I'm the thumbnail will catch my attention. I may watch a video that's completely irrelevant with a good thumbnail. So make sure that you're considering all the different media that are available to you and all the different ways that you can, you know, as Nate talked about with, you know, borrowing AJ Cohn's phrase that search engines are blind five year olds. And you want to make sure that you remember they need a lot of coaching. And go in there and make sure that you put your own transcript. If you can optimize your channel as well as any individual videos, you know the channel is one of the more underutilized opportunities within YouTube. So like I said, we'll do an entire episode that talks about how to use YouTube as part of a digital marketing strategy. But the general overall principle that we're getting to here is make sure that you understand the value that this type of platform brings for users that choose to engage with content in more of a visual way than they would otherwise in, say, a you know an informational context that would be better served by an article. Okay, so this week, there is no devil's advocate segment. It is the gospel truth that you should go to top tier, to second tier search engines and optimize. But with that said, let, let's, let's run through some, some really rapid fire quick tips about how you can have the best return on your time. So I'll go first. And what I'm gonna say first is the very first thing we said in the intro of this, of this page. Don't ignore of this episode, excuse me. Don't, don't ignore, ignore this Google. Episode either. <laughs> you know, don't ignore Google, but don't fixate on Google. You know, you have to diversify your marketing strategies based on where your audience is. 
You know, you want to chase the customer. You want to chase the opportunity to grow your business. You're not chasing the whimsical nature of Google's algorithm, you know, especially if you're in a platform, say, in local, like we talked about before, where they haven't quite figured it out yet. Make sure you focus on the customer and what the customer wants, and that is going to help drive you to these individual search engines or these alternative search engines that will help you reach them in a more authentic way. Yeah, and go back and, and test where your customers are. You know, if you're local, this might be something as simple as asking people how they found you. You might be surprised, you know, how many people found you on Yelp, how many people found you on Kudzu. You know, use use your analytics. Look for yeah. referring traffic. You know, be able to say, I know there are individual sites. If you're, you know, if you're a lawyer or an attorney, I know that I think it's fine law that actually will send you analytics insights to, or AVO will send you analytics insights to how people have engaged with your page. They put an individual track, I think it's avo.com, that yep. uses an individual phone number so that they can tell you how many phone, you know, phone calls they generated. Use the analytics that are available with you. Whenever we talk about testing, it is essential that anything that you're going to test, you have to be able to measure. You know, Peter Drucker is my, one of my favorite phrases in, you know, in all of, all of business, really, in general, is you can't manage what you don't measure. So when we go out and test, it is also essential that you're measuring the impact of those tests so you can make data-driven decisions based on the information that you received. Yeah, speaking of, of niches, uh, I, I know if you're a manufacturer and you see Global Spec show up or you see Thomas Nut show up, that probably means that people are going there and trying to find you and not via Google, and, and that might be a good place to start with and and try to grow. Or if you're or if you're a manufacturer and you Google yourself and you keep seeing Thomas Net and Global Spec show up, <laughs> that's a Barnacle SEO opportunity for you that I can almost guarantee you is not being you know fully leveraged by a lot of folks in the manufacturing industry. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and and. and no matter where you are, if you if that means going to some of these second tier search engines, if you're going straight for Google, it's always helpful to provide as much detailed, structured info as possible to judge relevance. And this isn't just for providing information for information's sake. You provide information because people look at it, and and that kind of information matters. People want to know if you're the right choice. Uh, getting other people to endorse you in some way. For Google Focus SEO, we talk about links, but really links are just a way for people to say, hey, this is a trusted resource. What does that mean if you're trying to optimize for the App Store, for Amazon, for YouTube? That might mean reviews. It might mean purchases if you're on Amazon. It might mean engagement if you're on YouTube. Try to get other people to endorse and show search engines that you're the right choice. And last sure, one. No, go ahead. Do the last one. The most I'm going gonna, gonna to wrap it all up here for you guys and tell you that remember that search engine optimization is really just a grand experiment in reverse engineering. You know, we've used that phrase before, but it's, it rings as true as it is true here as it does when we're talking about specifically Google. You know, search engine optimization is a grand experiment in reverse engineering. And the insights that you can gain by understanding that search engines are looking for two primary elements. They're looking for relevance and they're looking for trust. The way that they define that is going to differ from you know, engine to engine. But the idea is that if you can be able to understand that you want to find out how a search engine evaluates relevance and trust, you can pull out individual and tactical things that you can do with your website or your app store listing or your Yelp listing. You, know, you can find things that you can do with your organic visibility that you can do today that is going to help you not only in that search engine, not only in Google, but also in connecting with your audience and expanding the scope of that audience beyond what you would have if you had fixated solely on one search engine. All right. You can find the show notes, links to things we mentioned, and our contact information at bamboochalupa.com. Speaking of second-tier search engines, uh, you should subscribe to the podcast in iTunes and leave a comment and rating while you're there. It gives us great feedback, and it helps others discover the show. So for Brett Snyder, I'm Nate Shiver. Thanks for listening.